small changes can add up to big shifts in the environment. We know this from decades of research on addictive substances. I understand we really would all like to believe that we're in charge, that we have complete freedom over what we eat. But how free can we be? Living in a saturated environment, one that continuously surrounds us with food products carefully engineered to get us hooked and keep us coming back for more. Those kids in the tenderloin, they apparently live in what's called a food desert. They don't even have access to a grocery store, really. What's a grocery store when it's stuffed with junk food 74% of it loaded with added sugar? All the health experts will tell you, shop around the perimeter of this grocery store that way you can steer your way around all the junk that's in the middle. But how different is that from a strategy that steers children around drug dealers in the tenderloin? We can do so much better than this. We don't have to live in an environment that is ready to get us fat, and then blames us for the health consequences in the medical bills. We don't have to sit by and watch our children suffer from diseases of adulthood. We can re-rig this environment to make it safe. It's not about personal choice anymore. It's about our public choice. Now let's turn to the second question. Could it be that these psychological consequences of poverty have implications for economic decision-making that make it hard to escape poverty? And there's two ways that you might imagine this could happen. The first is that the stress that's brought on by poverty might affect economic choices in subtle ways. And there's now evidence suggesting that when you're under stress you're much more impatient than you are when you're not stressed. And that's not a good thing if you're supposed to make long-term decisions and investments in things like health care and education. And so unless you, poverty causes stress, stress makes you impatient. And then that impatience doesn't help you to lift yourself out of poverty. But there's a second sense in which the psychological consequences of poverty might exacerbate poverty. And that is that they may simply incapacitate you. So when chronic stress turns into full-fledged clinical depression, it's very hard for people to keep earning a living. So you don't think your efforts will amount to anything. You know no amount of information about returns to education can convince you otherwise. It's hard for you to even get out of bed in the morning and your livelihood crumbles. So this is bad enough when you're wealthy, but it's worse when you're poor. And you don't have as much of a safety net to fall back on. So as a result of this, there's a silent epidemic of depression among the poor. And that's the problem not only for psychological well-being, but also for economic outcomes.
One of the social issues faced by the state of Alaska is the lack of mental and emotional well-being of the native Alaskans. It is very unfortunate that many of the Native Americans are living under poor conditions throughout the country. In the cases of Native Alaskans, even virtually entire villages are suffering from a lack of mental and emotional well-being, which includes continuing poor physical and mental health. Alcohol abuse, domestic violence, homicides, and suicides are frequent among them, which of course, lead to families falling apart. It is tragic to see that many children are abused and not educated properly. As a matter of fact, the children themselves are abusing alcohol and other chemicals, and the rate is increasing over the time. Since parents are suffering from mental illnesses and alcohol abuse, they can't take care of their children, so many children are being taken care of by others or simply neglected. Therefore, we can conclude that Alaskan natives are losing hold of their communities, cultural identities, and most importantly, their childhoods. So you can see how serious the issue is. Plus, rather than making a living for themselves, they are depending on public services and subsidies. They have lost control of and responsibility for their economy and governing institutions. But you can see from the relatively crooked and narrow streets of the city of Rome as they look from above today, you can see that again, the city grew in a fairly ad hoc way, as I mentioned. It wasn't planned all at once. It just grew up over time, beginning in the 8th century BC. Now this is interesting. Because what we know about the Romans is when they were left to their own devices and they could build the city from scratch, they didn't let it grow in an ad hoc way. They, they structured it in a, in a very care, very methodical way. That was basically based on military strategy, military planning. The Romans they couldn't have conquered the world without obviously having a masterful military enterprise. And they everywhere they went on their various campaigns, their various military campaigns. They would build, build camps and those camps were always laid out in a very geometric plan along a grid, usually square or rectangular. For centuries, boys were top of the class. But these days, that's no longer the case. A new study by the OECD, a club of mostly rich countries, examined how 15-year-old boys and girls performed at reading, mathematics, and science. Boys still score somewhat better at maths, and in science the genders are roughly equal. But when it comes to the students who really struggle, the difference is stark. Boys are 50% more likely than girls to fall short of basic standards in all three areas. 
Researchers suggest that doing homework set by teachers is linked to better performance in maths, reading, and science. Boys, it appears, spend more of their free time in the virtual world. They are 17% more likely than girls to play collaborative online games than girls every day. They also use the internet more. Third, peer pressure plays a role. A lot of boys decide early on that they are just too cool for school which means they're more likely to be rowdy in class. Teachers mark them down for this. In anonymous tests, boys perform better. In fact, the gender gap in reading drops by a third when teachers don't know the gender of the pupil they are marking. So what can be done to close this gap? Getting boys to do more homework and cut down on screen time would help. But most of all, abandoning gender stereotypes would benefit all students. Boys in countries with the best schools read much better than girls. And girls in Shanghai excel in mathematics. They outperform boys from anywhere else in the world. I understand your professor has been discussing several Eastern Woodland Indian tribes in your study of Native American cultures. As you have probably learned, the Eastern Woodland Indians get their name from the forest-covered areas of the Eastern United States where they lived. The earliest woodland cultures date back 9,000 years, but the group we'll focus on dates back only to about 700 AD. We now call these Native Americans the Mississippian culture, because they settled in the Mississippi River Valley. This civilization is known for its flat-topped monuments called Temple Mounds. They were made of earth and used as temples and official residences. The temple mounds were located in the central square of the city, with the huts of the townspeople built in rows around the plaza. The Mississippian people were city dwellers. But some city residents earned their living as farmers, tending the fields of corn, beans, and squash that surrounded the city. The city's artisans made arrowheads, leather goods, pottery, and jewelry. Traders came from far away to exchange raw materials for these items. In the slides I'm about to show, you will see models of a Mississippian city. Most Americans take energy for granted, but for many families, maintaining access to reliable and affordable energy is a persistent challenge and a significant material hardship. This is a problem referred to as energy insecurity, and it affects millions of American households each year. We have found that energy insecurity is a growing and vexing problem among low-income households, and the COVID-19 pandemic has made this problem worse. Our analysis finds that there are disparities in the rates of energy insecurity across various socio-demographic groups. 
Black and Hispanic households, for example, are significantly more likely to experience energy insecurity and face utility disconnection than white households. So, too, are households with young children, individuals that require electronic medical devices, and those in dwellings with inefficient or poor conditions. Households that cannot pay for energy are unable to power electronic learning or medical devices, keep perishable healthy food in the refrigerator, or maintain safe body temperatures. Under conditions of extreme heat or cold, people can suffer from mental and physical health consequences, including the possibility of death. Strategies for coping with uncomfortable temperatures, such as burning trash or sitting in one's car with the heat running, can lead to tragic outcomes as well. Our research underscores the importance of public policy that targets energy insecurity and its underlying causes. Weatherization assistance, incentive for residential solar power, energy bill assistance, and utility disconnection protections are all viable strategies for helping the millions of households across the country that are currently unable to pay their energy bills. Why the bumblebees pick some flowers over others? Researchers have known for a while that flowers' color can be a signal. Color in shorthand that says to a bee, Hey, I get some good quality nectar here, want to stop by for a visit. But new findings show that bees also use color to get clues about a flower's temperature. And according to a study from a British research team published in the journal Nature, some like it hot. Bees use up a lot of energy just stay in warm on some days. In fact, they can't even fly if they are too cold. So if one flower is warmer than another, a bee can save some of its fuel by basking on that flower while it's doing its pollinating business. And it turns out that bumblebees consistently do choose warmer flowers over cooler ones, even when the two flowers offer up the same quantity and quality of nectar. Some plants seem to be evolutionarily adapted to be slightly warmer because the warmer ones get visited more by the chilly bees. When it comes to getting pollinated, apparently the heat is on, and that is the buzz. You might think that most of the patients at sleep clinics are being treated for sleeplessness, commonly referred to as insomnia, but that is not the case. The majority of sleep clinic patients suffer from disorders of excessive sleep, or hypersomnia. While most insomniacs somehow manage to drag themselves through the day and function at acceptable, although not optimal levels, this is not so for people who suffer from hypersomnia. 
They are incapacitated by irresistible urges to sleep during the day, often in inappropriate situations, at business meetings, in supermarkets, or at parties. Even more dangerous is their failure to remain awake when driving or operating machinery. Falling asleep in such situations could obviously be life-threatening. Many hypersomniacs suffer from narcolepsy, for which the primary symptom is excessive daytime sleepiness. Though not apparent in childhood, this symptom most often appears for the first time during the teen years and continues throughout a person's life. The sleep attacks may occur as many as 15 to 20 times during the course of the day and last for periods from 15 minutes up to two hours. What can be done to help those suffering from narcolepsy? There are certain drugs that can help, and specialists suggest voluntary napping to decrease the frequency of such sleep attacks. Look at any photo of Earth's night side, and you see the planet lit up like a Christmas decoration. As the glowing lights of bustling cities expand, the serenity of natural darkness wanes. But the repercussions are not just the loss of the starry night sky. Light pollution also affects animals who depend on a nighttime environment to survive. Many bird species use the stars to navigate at night. Baby sea turtles use moonlight reflected off the ocean to guide them back to the water. City lights can confuse them and veer them off course. Humans are not immune either. Excessive exposure to artificial light at night can increase the risk of sleep disorders. And it's also been linked to obesity, depression, diabetes, and even cancer. A leader can define or clarify goals by issuing a memo or an executive order, an edict or a fatwa or a tweet, by passing a law, barking a command, or presenting an interesting idea in a meeting of colleagues. Leaders can mobilize people's energies in ways that range from subtle, quiet persuasion to the coercive threat or the use of deadly force.
Sometimes a charismatic leader such as Martin Luther King Jr. can define goals and mobilize energies through rhetoric and the power of example. We can think of leadership as a spectrum, in terms of both visibility and the power the leader wields. On one end of the spectrum, we have the most visible, authoritative leaders like the President of the United States or the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, or a dictator such as Hitler or Gaddafi. At the opposite end of the spectrum is casual, low-key leadership found in countless situations every day around the world, leadership that can make a significant difference to the individuals whose lives are touched by it. Over the centuries, the first kind the out-in-front, authoritative leadership has generally been exhibited by men. Some men in positions of great authority, including Nelson Mandela, have chosen a strategy of, leading from behind, more often, however, top leaders have been quite visible in their exercise of power. Women, as well as some men, have provided casual, low-key leadership behind the scenes. But this pattern has been changing, as more women have taken up opportunities for visible, authoritative leadership. Wilson came then from a different world, and he became the focal point of a broad mainstream American culture that thought that modern literature and wanted modern literature to be able to be read and appreciated by ordinary people. They were not modernists in an abstract sense, and certainly some of them, like T.S. Eliot and Faulkner, were too difficult for some of their writings to be read by ordinary people, but this was a world before the division between the brows or between elite or whatever had established itself as part of our consciousness. Wilson was a major player in the successful effort of his generation to establish at the heart of American life an innovative literature that would equal the great cultures of Europe. And he knew that the great cultures of Europe were there. He was not a product of a narrow American studies kind of training at all. He joined a high artistic standard with an openness to all experience and a belief that literature was as much a part <coughs> of life for everyone as conversation. He thought that Proust and Joyce and Yeats and Eliot could and should be read by ordinary Americans and help that to happen. Wilson was a very various man. Over a period of almost 50 years, he was a dedicated a literary journalist, an investigative reporter, a brilliant memoirist, and dedicated journal keeper.
With over 40 years unrivaled experience and a worldwide reputation, BSI leads the way in testing and certification of fire safety products. Based in our dedicated labs in Hemel Hempstead, our team provides BSI kite mark and CE testing and certification for a broad range of products including fire extinguishers, hoses, alarm panels and heat and smoke detectors. We help clients to gain access into the European market by ensuring that products meet all the CE mark requirements. And we're familiar with the market access regulations of most countries across the world, enabling customers to enter markets globally. The BSI Kite Mark is categorized as a British super brand and acknowledged the world over as a symbol of trust, integrity and quality. It provides the reassurance that vital product safety and performance requirements have been met. Our team subjects each product to a rigorous set of tests, along with robust production control audits, designed specifically to ensure that they perform to required standards of safety and quality. We test for compatibility of fire detection and fire alarm system components to ensure that they're compatible and connectable. This service meets the growing requirement of European regulatory authorities to meet national installation guidelines. We also perform tests on individual detection components. Fire suppression products, such as fire extinguishers, are subjected to rigorous tests designed to ensure that they're effective, safe and capable of performing in the environments and conditions in which they're stored and used. The symbols for BSI Kite Mark and CE certification represent quality, safety and trust. For specifiers, they demonstrate a commitment to best practice procurement. And for the public, they provide the reassurance that fire safety products are effective and reliable. I want you to try and remember two things. First, I want you to try and remember learning how to ride a bike. Maybe you have a scar you received when you flipped over the handlebars. The next thing I want you to remember is how to ride a bike. The reason I asked you to recall both of these memories is that they belong to two different designated realms of memory. Memory is a fluid and dynamic system that is exceedingly complicated. To this end, psychologists have attempted to divide memory up to make it easier to study. There are two main categories. Explicit memory is a memory that can be intentionally and consciously recalled. This is your memory of riding a bike, of falling over the handlebars and skinning your knee. The other is implicit memory, which is an experiential or functional form of memory that cannot be consciously recalled. This is your memory of how to ride a bike or how to balance. These are often not tied to a visual memory, but are more like muscle memory. The examples of implicit memory include using language naturally, driving and reading, and answering multiple questions in the test etc. will be natural. 
Let's look at explicit and implicit memory in a little more detail and see how age influences these. It is an experimental or functional form of memory. Explicit memory consists of a great deal of highly personal memories related to time, space and people. It is totally different from implicit memory. Now if we look at the examples of explicit memory, it includes remembering people's birthdays and answering multiple questions on the test. populations near the equator have evolved dark skin over many generations because of exposure to the fierce rays of the sun. A similar phenomenon has also occurred in other parts of the animal kingdom. The African grass mouse is a good example. Most mice are nocturnal, but the African grass mouse is active during daylight hours. This means that it spends its days searching for food in the semi-dry bush and scrub habitats of eastern and southern Africa. Its fur is striped like a chipmunk's, which helps it blend in with its environment. Because it spends a lot of time in the intense tropical sun, the grass mouse has also evolved two separate safeguards against the sun's ultraviolet radiation. First, like the populations of humans in this region of the world, the skin of the grass mouse contains lots of melanin, or dark pigment. Second, and quite unusual, this mouse has a layer of melanin pigmented tissue between its skull and skin. This unique cap provides an extra measure of protection for the grass mouse and three other types of African mouse-like rodents that are active during the day. The only other species scientists have identified with the same sort of skull adaptation is the white tent-making bat of the Central American tropics. Although these bats sleep during the day, they do so curled up with their heads exposed. Did you ever wonder why it is that most people are programmed to sleep at night instead of during the day? If there's something about the cycle of light and dark that's telling us when to sleep, then shouldn't the sleep cycle of a blind person be different? As it turns out, many blind people, people with no visual perception of light at all, do have the same sleep cycle as sighted people. 
So now you're wondering, how can this happen? The answer is hormones. One hormone in particular. It's called melatonin. In sighted people, the level of melatonin goes up at night or when it's dark, and goes down in the day or when it's light. It's believed that it's the presence of this hormone in the blood that gives us the urge to sleep. If an increase in melatonin level programs sighted people to sleep at night, then what about blind people? A researcher named Dr. Charles Chesler tells about an interesting experiment. He tried shining a bright light into the eyes of some blind people. When he did this, he noticed that the level of the melatonin in the blood of these subjects went down, just as it would do for sighted people. Somehow, the eyes of these subjects, even though they were damaged and had no visual perception of light, could tell their brain when there was more or less light. Now, this doesn't work for all blind people. In fact, most of Chesler's subjects had no hormonal response to light at all. Further research may be able to explain the sensitivity to light in terms of the type of blindness of the subject. Dr. Haynes his or her finished picture on a wall, and everyone can see it. A composer writes a work, but no one can hear it until it is performed. Professional singers and players have great responsibilities, but the composer is utterly dependent on them. A student of music needs as long and as arduous a training to become a performer as a medical student needs to become a doctor. Most training is concerned with technique, for musicians have to have the muscular proficiency of an athlete or a ballet dancer. Singers practice breathing every day, as their vocal cords would be inadequate without controlled muscular support. String players practice moving the fingers of the left hand up and down, while drawing the bow to and fro with the right arm, two entirely different movements. Singers and instrumentalists have to be able to get every note perfectly in tune. Pianists are spared this particular anxiety, for the notes are already there waiting for them, and it is the piano tuner's responsibility to tune the instrument for them but they have their own difficulties. The hammers that hit the strings have to be coaxed not to sound like percussion, and each overlapping tone has to sound clear. This problem of getting clear texture is one that confronts student conductors. They have to learn to know every note of the music and how it should sound, and they have to aim at controlling these sounds with fanatical but selfless authority. Technique is of no use unless it is combined with musical knowledge and understanding. Great artists are those who are so thoroughly at home in the language of music that they can enjoy performing works written in any century.
The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the ba brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills, and, and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting um, the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean um, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction with their own adults. Development and the impact of experience on development is not a one-way street. It's a back and forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ, which has multiple sections that specialize in different um, uh, kind of processes. So we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and other parts that are involved in processing of emotion and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally uh, kind of well put together and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress, no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference. How much sun exposure might one need to get their target vitamin D level to that found associated with the lowest total mortality rate? Well, it depends. It depends on our age, how long we're exposed, the time of day, the time of year, our latitude, our skin color, our use of sunscreen, how much of our body we're exposing. Even in Boston, though, all it takes is 10 to 12 minutes of midday summer sun without sunblock if you're a young, pale, naked Caucasian. But then you're golden. Actually, you'd be a little pink. Note, though, if you're some old white guy prancing around naked on the commons, you're not going to make it. As I hope you're beginning to appreciate, it's not easy to make a one-size-fits-all recommendation for how much sun exposure one might need. And low vitamin D status, despite abundant sun exposure, has been found even in the best of circumstances young, half-naked skateboarders in Honolulu, right, mostly Caucasian, averaging 30 hours of sun a week, and 51% didn't even make it to 30. If they can't, who can't? And these days, even if we're an albino nudist at the equator, how often might we be getting outside in the middle of the day with a desk job? So, if we're really interested in getting to the vitamin D level associated with the lowest mortality rates, and our lifestyle or latitude won't allow us the necessary sun exposure, then one needs to take vitamin D supplements. The, the piddly amount added to soy milk, calf milk, margarine, or mushrooms would simply not be enough.
Supersymmetry is a mathematical idea that people have developed in effort to understand the sharpest organizing principle for the fundamental constituents of matter. You see, we have learned that particles that seem to be different can actually secretly be united by certain symmetry principles. So we're used to the fact that there are symmetric objects in the world like a, a sphere or a basketball. You turn a sphere and even though you've transformed it, it looks the same, fundamentally. We found that certain particles, when you transform one particle into another, even though it looks like the identity of the particle has changed, overall the equations describing it, they don't change at all, an underlying level of symmetry. But what we've not been able to do is find a symmetry that would relate certain kinds of particles, namely matter particles and force particles. Matter particles are particles like electrons and muons, quarks. Force particles are like photons and gluons and WZ bosons. Supersymmetry is a symmetry that actually relates these two kinds, these two classes of particles. And people have proven that supersymmetry is the last possible symmetry of the fundamental particles that our mathematics, reality, has not yet been shown to make use of. So people are now trying to see whether that symmetry might actually be at work in the world. Can we find evidence for it in our understanding of the fundamental particles?